Oh, okay, this is gonna be okay. It's fine, it's gonna be fine. It's a first date. <laughs> plenty of first dates. I've been on plenty of first dates. Oh my god, how many first dates have I been on? <gasps> I have been on a lot of first dates. Is that gonna matter? Are they gonna care? No, they've gotta know that I've been on, like, a, a lot of first dates. Oh. I mean, it's, it's one thing to come to a relationship with a history, but humans never have this much history. Okay, but they've got to know. They've got to know. I mean, look at me. Well, I mean, don't look at me, because I look fabulous for my age, but still, they know I've been around a long time. I need to not worry about it. I need to not think about it. This is very... This is very 1900s thinking. This is very early 20th century, late 18th century thinking. Nobody cared about this in the 16th. That's not true because they would have cared if I had had this many partners. And they would have also cared that I don't die ever. Uh, they would have tried. Actually, they did try. Wow, what jerks. I can't believe I dated that guy. That was a first date. On the bright side, whatever happens tonight, it's not going to be as bad as that first date was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be fine. Uh, comparatively, it's it's got to be fine. So long as they don't try to burn me as a witch. Huh. I wonder if they ever got a witch. I wonder if witches are real. I mean, you would think vampires are real, but I've never seen a witch. You would think in this amount of time I'd have seen a witch. Huh. Oh. All right. Showtime. Huh. Maybe I shouldn't have started a fire. Screw it. Hi there. You, you look great. C come on in, sorry, come in. H have you eaten? Would you, would you like something to nibble on? I, I got something, uh, I, c I can't remember if it's pastrami or salami or bologna. It's, it's one of those things. It's been a while since I've had to eat anything like that, but, um, it's, it's some kind of meat and, and cheese. Meat and cheese. Oh, God, are you vegan? Okay, all right. Ooh. Or, oh, kosher? Hindu? Okay, well, I, I also got fruit in, in case you didn't want meat or cheese. I, um, I got fruit. They, 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 they had really, really big grapes. I, I didn't actually recognize them as, as grapes, but they had them, and here they are. Look at that giant. Uh -huh. mm. I'm not nervous. I might be nervous. <sighs> well, yeah. Um, it's been a while since I've done this. You know, um, yeah, I, I just kind of gotten to know somebody new, um, and especially with, um, what I, I think, if, if, if I'm reading this right, this is a romantic thing, yes? Okay, yeah, so it's been a long time. And, uh, I mean, a lot of things are different. I, I, I mean, not on me. <laughs> on me, nothing has been different since, um, well, since the Dutch came to New Amsterdam. B but, uh, you know, <laughs> expectations are different. Customs are different. Um, a lot is different. 
one thing that's different is, um, I've never been with a human who, uh, who knew about me from the outset. You would think that it takes some of the pressure off, right? Um, you would think that there doesn't have to be any big reveal, any coming out, as it were. Uh, but I feel very exposed very early on in this relationship. And it, uh, it's, it's putting me on my back foot a bit. I don't have this secret. I'm accustomed to being wary around humans. I mean, yes. We feed on them. And in theory, that makes us the predators. But that's not how it goes. We're as vulnerable as any other creature given the right weapons. And if humans know what we are, then they know how to hurt us. And considering they're afraid of us, or were afraid, more humans are less so now. But it did mean that remaining secret mattered. You had to know who you could trust. The right weapons? Oh. No, no, it's, it's okay. I don't think you're plotting to assassinate me. Um, it, it's silver. Anything silver. It keeps us from healing. It poisons us. If you cut us with something silver, the wound won't heal. Much less shoot us with something silver. Feed us something silver. Oh. I've seen some vampires come to an ugly end when they'd been poisoned like that. Oh no, we can eat. It just doesn't do anything for us. And a lot of us spent a lot of time and wasted so much money on food that didn't do anything to keep us alive. Uh, just to be able to blend in. Hmm. What is it? No, really, what? Go ahead and ask. I promise not to be offended. Oh, the mirrors! <laughs> uh, actually, no. That's not an old wives' tale. Oh. Yeah, I can see. You see my reflection. Um, that's because that's a newer mirror. It's probably made with aluminum on the back. The older mirrors were made with a coating of silver on the back. That's how they reflected your image. And, uh, as you see, vampires and silver do not mix. Everything about that silver wants to reject everything about us. Some people speculate it's because we have no souls and silver is pure. I don't know. But I do know that if you take the fibrins from our veins, the... Oh, uh, uh, that's what we have in way of blood. Uh, m most people have this fibrous protein in their blood that helps clot when they bleed. Um, we have mostly fibrous proteins, uh, and those polymerized fibrins, along with a few platelets, uh, form the hemostatic sludge that we have in our veins. Actually, fun fact, I've, I've been donating mine. The scientists have been studying it and using it to evaluate the agents in there for wound care applications. <laughs> yeah, the idea of, um, Vampires saving people. Kind of wild. I, I mean, it's not... It's not that unheard of. Uh, we have been known 
to help heal people, letting them drink our, for lack of a better word, blood. But anyway, I I'm getting off topic. Uh, if you put our blood under a microscope and introduce silver particulates, you can see the fibrins trying to get away from the silver. And vampire blood is naturally static. I mean, they refer to it as hemostasis. It's just wild. You like that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is pretty crazy and very exciting. It's, it's always very exciting to see what new things humans come up with. And every once in a while, you'll see this burst of invention and creation and this lurching forward in technology that happens so quickly. It started with the Industrial Revolution. We'd gone so many centuries with sort of the same number of tools, the same kinds of tools, small improvements made here and there, but for the most part, we worked everything by hand. Everything was powered by humans or animals or wind or water. We hadn't been able to harness heat. We hadn't been able to harness fire. Suddenly the steam engine comes along. At first it was only used in mines. Same thing with um, carts on rails. It was more than a hundred years before those carts and that steam came out of the mines in order to make the locomotive. But in the meantime, people started to learn from place to place about these steam engines. And the more people who learned about them, the more applications people came up with for them. Power looms became a thing running on steam. They increased production and decreased costs so that the textiles industry was booming. And for the first time that I know of, in Europe and America anyway, average people had the ability to gain wealth. There had always been some moderate ability of people to increase their skill in their trade, develop a craft, have it passed down from their parents, and make a name for themselves selling something that they'd made. But for most of us, it was just a matter of being a wealthy landowner or being a worker on his land. I mean, don't get me wrong, the vast majority of us were in the same boat and it was good clean living. But if your skill set was that you were intelligent, that you were good with words, that you were dexterous and had an eye for light and color and could reproduce what you saw, well, your opportunities for becoming an artist or a writer or a mathematician were all very limited. We didn't use our human resources to their best ability. What you did was determined by where you were born and what your parents did, what they could pass down to you. With the boom of these new industries, suddenly there were different opportunities, not all of them good. But now, in the time in between seasons, in between working the fields, we could get jobs at factories. We could collect a little cash. We could have something in case we needed a doctor. We could have something to buy a few little things that we didn't make ourselves. We began to collect things. Not a lot, mind you, because Lord knows we didn't make much in factories. But it was a start. And over the course of a few generations, our families began to collect property. It might be a dresser that you don't have to make or buy yourself because you inherited it from your grandparents. It might be a mirror that a vampire can't see herself in. But it became property 
that had a value to it, that you could sell if you had to. But just the fact that you didn't have to buy it, or make it, was time and money that you saved, that you started off with. Now what we didn't know at the time was that our meager property that we earned by working in the mills was made off of the back of other farm workers who were in much harsher conditions than we were. The cotton that was being woven by those power mills was picked by other farm workers who would have another century or more before they could have any sort of upward mobility because they were being literally enslaved instead of just figuratively. I'd like to say that if we'd known at the time, we would have not worked those looms. But that's not true at all. If, if we hadn't, someone else would. And morality is for people who can afford it. Morality is for people who are safe. Morality is for people who don't need the money for a doctor for their child. Don't look at me like that. I'm not trying to justify the atrocities that were committed. I'm saying that most of us were not wealthy landowners. We did not own the factories. I'm saying that when we're given two shitty choices, whether to get some meager profit off of someone else's pain that will keep us alive, or to join them in their suffering and let our lives be on the line as well. We will make the shitty decision that benefits us. The shitty decision that keeps us alive. And frankly, if that gives you pause, we might not be right for each other. Because in all honesty, I've done much worse things to stay alive than unwittingly contributing to someone else's enslavement. Hmm. No. No. I have never attacked someone and fed till they were gone. But do you really think I've gotten to be this old of a vampire without anyone ever trying to kill me? Do you really think I got to be this old of a vampire by letting them? Yeah, exactly. But you forgive me for that, don't you? Because it's easy to forgive someone who is protecting themselves or who feels like they're protecting themselves. It's easier to forgive someone that you know and you like. Someone who you've seen do good things. You know, once upon a time, we used to know everyone we interacted with to one degree or another. And so we saw them in their good and their bad and their shame and their glory. And we knew that no one is ever just one thing or another. We're never just all evil or all good. We're all just a bunch of nuances, and we mostly want to be better, but we mostly fail. We do what we have to do when we feel threatened. We do what we have to do to take care of our children, or at least we do what we believe we have to do. People aren't different now than they used to be. I think the biggest problem with the world today is that people hear each other without knowing each other. We only get one glimpse of their opinions without seeing their nuances. And it's so very easy to brand them as evil or good based on what we think is the right thing to do when we haven't walked in their shoes, when we don't know what they feel threatened by. Right now, you're willing to forgive me 
for something that just a few minutes ago you would have thought was unforgivable. Benefiting from someone else's suffering, their enslavement. And you'll forgive me because you see me as more than just one thing or another. And that's just as well. Because frankly, it's also very easy to forget that we, ourselves, are never as perfect as we want other people to be. Fifteen minutes ago, you would have judged someone who benefits off of the back of slavery. And you would have done it while wearing at least one item that was created in a sweatshop. Hmm. Oh, but that's all that was available, exactly. We make the decisions we can with the shitty choices we're given. But you know what we can do? We can try to offset the spiritual carbon footprint of the shitty choices that we're given. <laughs> well, you do it by being kind when you can. You do it by trying not to judge other people for the shitty choices that they make. You do it by trying to do good deeds when you have the opportunity. Oh, uh, speaking of which, that brings me to what I thought you might like to do for our date. Okay, well, there are places online where you can do volunteer work remotely. I found a site that lets you just pop in, help with some projects, and then pop out. Whether you want to work on it for a minute or a year, you can just do as much as you like. And they've got like a multitude of different projects based on what your interests and your skills are. Earlier today, I was reading letters from the 17 and 1800s that have been scanned, and I was just typing out what I saw there so that later researchers can just search through them and study things like the cultural, religious, and family connections through correspondences. They're trying to learn about all the religious and ethnic minorities who have been really underrepresented in our history books. Before that, I was looking at pictures and helping AI to recognize the germinal centers of lymph nodes in breast cancer patients. It was really easier than it sounds. They taught you what it looks like very quickly, and you could just circle it on the image with the little graphic pen they gave you. Um, I kind of thought you might like to work with me on one where we'll listen to the sounds of <laughs> babies' voices <laughs> um, and classifying audio clips based on whether it's speech or language or crying or just nonsense words and label whether or not we think it sounds like a baby or a child. It's going to help them learn about how speech develops in children across the world and eventually it can help with early detection and speech impediments. But also while we're listening, baby chatter and baby laughter is kind of a recipe for having to hit the serotonin. <laughs> yes. It is very easy to lose your mind over an adorable child. A friend of mine calls it baby rabies. <laughs> so, what do you think? Would you like to do that? Would you like to take a look at other projects? Or would you just like to sit and watch a movie? Yes, I, I do think it sounds like um, a very different kind of date. I, I was hoping that you would think that was a good thing. <laughs> Okay, great. Yes, uh, let's do it. Let's see, what is it? It's uh, zoo, zoo, zoo. Oh, zooniverse.org. Okay, here we go. Alrighty. Baby babies, here we come. <laughs> hey, cupcakes. So... Those of you wondering, yes, that is an actual website, zooniverse.org, Z-O-O-N-I-V-E-R-S-E dot -E org, and it is actually kind of fun and really 
relaxing the projects that they can have you do. Uh, I spent so much time identifying beluga whales and learning how to tell the difference between a male and a female, which um, I, I, I didn't need to be looking at that many beluga whales that close and personal. I prefer to look at the other end of them where they're smiling. Anyway, that's not the point. You can look at the smiling belugas by just counting the numbers in a pod that go past in front of a camera, or you can look at pictures that were taken by drones over the Galapagos Island and mark off how many iguanas you see. Um, <laughs> it's not all about biology. You can help spot comets or clouds on Mars, uh, sunspots. You can search the skies for evidence of extraterrestrial civilizations. You can read articles and make notes annotizing literary characters to help AI build a better understanding of storytelling uh, so that it can replace me. But in the meantime, uh, <laughs> there are just a lot of different pro programs, a lot of different projects that you can work on, and they're kind of fun. And they help researchers collect data. In the meantime, though, I have not yet been replaced by AI. Uh, so, <laughs> and when it happens, I'll have it coming because I use AI in my, <laughs> in my uh, thumbnails all the time. <laughs> it will be just, it will be digital karma when it happens to me. But in the meantime, I am here. I am alive. I am a real breathing, eating, human living person. And... <laughs> I didn't say that at all, weirdly, for a real and breathing, living human person. <sighs> Come on now, would I tell you that I was a real and living, breathing human person if I were not a real and living, breathing human person? Would a person lie about being a person? Quit asking me about it. All right, my fellow humans. I would like to thank you all for still giving me your support and uh, welcome. Let's see, we've got Steven Anderson and Dancing Vero. It's so nice to have you as my newest patrons. And of course, a special thank you to all of those who make it possible for me to do this as a part-time living. There is a non... <laughs> James can't think of a joke that isn't trite and creepy. Harper Evolution, Wolf9004, Vile Mal, Succubus Slave, Malice Celo, Army Guy 007, Mr. Fabulous, Tiny the Tax Man, Merrill, Inline Flaws, Mr. Rickles, On and Nick, Always Able, Infinite Moon, Old Bean UK, Kalua Bear, Forces, The Swaggy Llama, Cody, Art Lowe, Pierce Taylish, Tom Berry Shuffle, and Christian Kaleapa'a. I hope you will all have a wonderful day until I speak to you again. Be as good to yourselves as you are to me. I will talk to you tomorrow.